like he was made in the image and likeness of God, as it tells us in Genesis 1.27. You know, I touched him on the shoulder when I was speaking to him. I looked him in the eyes when I was speaking to him. And he was just moved by that. Uh, at the end of the talk, I was like, Dre, it's been two and a half hours. I'm going to miss my bus back to Cleveland. I you know, really got to get going. And uh, Dre reached out his hand like this. And grabbed me like that. And he grabbed me on the forearm like this. And he pulled me really close to his face like this. And made me feel very uncomfortable like I'm doing this young man right here. And he says, Peter, and I'm just backing away from bad breath. I mean, he's homeless. He hasn't brushed his teeth in a while, right? And I said, yes, Dre. He said, Peter, you will fulfill your mission. And laughed and said, no, sure, Dre, whatever my mission is, I'm sure I'll fulfill it. He said, no, look at me, say it, and believe it. So I looked Dre in the eyes and said, Dre, I will fulfill my mission. Now, guys, I'm 29 years old. I still can't grow silence. I'm still working on what my mission in life is. But I know that my mission right here and right now is to tell each and every one of you that you have a mission and you will fulfill it. Never doubt for one second that God has placed you on earth at this time period of history to make some impact, to make some difference. Whether that's just being a mom or just being a teacher, whether it's running for president, whatever it is, God has given you a specific mission and purpose to fulfill, and you will fulfill. All right, so those are my three lessons for the day. Number one, God can always bring good out of evil. Number two, we're always called to say yes to life. And number three, you have a mission, and you will all right, we're going to watch this short video now just for a little bit. It talks about personhood, what does it mean to be human, um, and then we'll discuss a little bit about what the 40 Days for Life is all about. Uh, just a quick note, Carol Edward, who you'll see on the video, um, she is a former abortionist, and she once said in another video that I watched that she has been a part of, uh, not directly, but having run these abortion facilities, she has been a part of 20,000 abortions. So this is a woman who knows what she's talking about. Abortion was so far in me. 
I never considered that I would ever get pregnant. I thought that was taken care of. And I said yes. I'm an absent minded professor, and I'm not by temperament interested in political or social issues. So it's unusual that I got involved in the abortion issue. I think the reason was outrage uh, on other moral issues that impact politics, like capital punishment or uh, the just war theory. Uh, I'm kind of agnostic. Uh, as a philosopher, I tend to skepticism and to question everything. I think that's a good method. It's a good beginning, but not a good ending of philosophy. But uh, I was amazed that the American public tolerates abortion when it seems to me, as a simple, commonsensical philosopher, that this is not a complex issue. Uh, I had been a single mom and already had two children. I couldn't imagine keeping a child. I chose my career over the life of my baby. Very selfish. But at the time, I thought it was self-preservation. But uh, as Dr. Bernard Nathanson, another good friend of mine, has said, when he speaks about how he and his friends engineered the abortion rights movement in this country, he said the church was asleep. He said, we took a conscious gamble that the church would remain relatively silent because he said, if the clergy had spoken up about this, we would never have gotten away with what we did. Uh, I got involved with abortion. I'm a form, former abortionist. I did not allow the reality of the humanity of this person in that womb to be great enough in my mind, in my heart, to say that, no, I can't do this. This is a developing human being. I hid behind the legal, or let's just say what the Supreme Court said, that it's okay, as long as I got a piece of paper from this woman saying it's okay to do it, I can throw away the reality scientifically, ethically, morally, and do what this woman that wants done, long as she pays me to do it. Now more than anything, our world needs to understand that abortion ends human life. Giving a voice to the innocent, recognizing the thousands that are building a culture of life, and encouraging others to do the same. This is Being Human. who want to impose their morality on women. Science and reason must be on the side of abortion. These assumptions are made every single day. But if we're going to be open-minded, we must question abortion. We have to question what it is and what it is not. Well, one of the reasons we can mistakenly see abortion as an act of mercy is that we neither see the victim, the baby. We don't see the act of violence. When we see it, and we certainly can't see it, because there are a lot of pictures available on the internet of what an abortion actually looks like, then we then it cuts through the rhetoric and it, it cuts through that, that, that deception that is so easy to fall into. But secondly, we don't see the other victim either. And what I mean is that while a person who goes to get an abortion might express at that moment a sense of relief. Follow them for some years. See the pain, see the despair, see the, uh, the devastating effect abortion has on that mother, and you begin to realize that was no act of mercy at all. Planned Parenthood and abortion clinics have um, some sad talking points, and one of the ones that we used was when she asked if it was a baby, we said it's a glob of tissue, product of conception, um, it's not a baby. And uh, they would ask, so of course we lied to them. 
And sometimes they would come in and say, wait a minute, I went to the library, and this is what it says my baby looks like. And I would say, who are you going to trust, the library or someone who sees what's in your uterus every day? It's not a baby. And, you know, my counselors were there for the same reason I was. They were hurt. They said the same thing. And yet we went in the back. And after each abortion, we had to reconstruct that baby to be sure all the body parts were there. They've succeeded in convincing themselves that that is only a pre-human or a potential human or tissue. So I think it's, it's primarily an intellectual thing. We've played this intellectual game with ourselves. We've, we've convinced ourselves that we are good, tolerant people and that the object of abortion is not a full person. We don't think of ourselves as Nazis or Aztecs or, or, or slave masters. If we did, we'd be terrified. Well, the way you tell a monkey from a human from a caterpillar is simply by the genome. If you examine the genome of, of just the one cell, once the sperm combines with that ovum, it's the human genome. That's how you determine, you know, if we, we swab some cells out of a person's mouth and then we examine that DNA. That's that's a human, you're going to find that's a human DNA. And if you look at the DNA in a one cell human, that's going to be human DNA. When you look at the DNA of a 105 year old human, that's human DNA. So it's your genetic profile or message that determines who you are, not what the Constitution says you are, not what the Jim Crow laws say you are. There is no such thing as a potential human being. That's an actual human being. It's a very small, very undeveloped human being that can't perform specifically human actions yet, but it will. And it's doing something, even from day one, that no non-human being can do. It's growing in human brain and nervous system. You take them back for a sonogram, and you get a picture of that baby on the sonogram. And the boyfriend is there, and he says, oh my goodness, it has arms, it has legs. He said, they told me it was a blob. It's a baby. I can see it. So the truth stands inside pregnancy centers. And almost every pregnancy center in the nation has a sonogram machine now to show them the truth. In an age where we have technology that shows without a doubt that the baby in the womb is a baby, and not a mass, but a baby, we have technology that shows the movements of the child and the sucking of the thumb and the yawning and those beautiful things that people are now framing uh, in the womb. You know, babies are being aborted right now who are developed enough to be saved within our neonatal intensive care units. So is it a baby? Well, it's a baby in the neonatal intensive care unit, but it's not a baby in the abortion clinic. We, we, we like that because it makes us feel good about ourselves with our absolutes and it enables us to make, take a moral vacation about other things. Well, yeah, life is sacred on the battlefield but not in the abortion clinic or vice versa. Or life is sacred in the nursing home but not in the slums or vice versa. Life is sacred everywhere. Ask Mother Teresa. So is it a baby? And if so, who decides that and why? And can personhood just be removed because of circumstances? These are questions that our culture has to ask, but we must be willing to find the answer.